Hi, I'm Linda, and this is episode 16 in my experiences dating as a senior. Though I will be doing a separate video on my relationship with RB, which went on for around six weeks. This date was special. It was the first time I have been on a date where the guy crashed his car with me in it. And it could have turned deadly as the car ended up halfway dangling over a steep embankment like in the Italian job. It started out as a nice Sunday outing. I had been dating RB for a month. He was highly educated and a lot of fun to chat with. At 11 a.m. he picked me up in his 2006 Toyota Corolla. We both preferred older cars and his was quite comfortable and even had a working CD player. We set out from my house in Cumbria for a drive that would normally take one hour 40 minutes to drive to at Cragside near Roxbury Morpeth, a very out of the way National Trust estate that had the first electric lights. Halfway there we stopped in Collarford at the George Hotel for lunch or tea or whatever you call the midday meal. It was a very nice warm pleasant day with the sun shining and lots of fluffy clouds. RB placed our order at the bar and we walked around the estate for a bit. We then went back in and picked a table in the bar area as the dining room was not yet open. Soon they brought out our bees meal, so he dug into it. After a bit, the server realized that my meal was not forthcoming. He soon found out that it had not been entered into the till correctly and was not on the books. They were very apologetic, made me my order, and gave it to me for free. I didn't mind waiting because I don't usually eat a meal that early. It was good food and we were soon on our way again. But was this an omen for things to come? It was a very pleasant country journey to Cragside. The estate is three miles across and was built by William Armstrong to generate hydraulic and electric power. And he had built the small lakes to drive the generator. The main house was like a castle with a labyrinth of rooms and exquisitely detailed Victorian interior with its own museum of his collections inside. I loved the cloisonne vases and lamps. It was basically the first smart house with numerous inventions the Armstrongs had created over the years. Like a hydroelectric rotating spit in the kitchen, the very first dishwasher, and a Turkish bath. Funny that one of the things that sticks with me is that all of the furniture where anyone could possibly sit had a pine cone on a tiny base in the middle of every seat, supposedly to keep people from sitting on them. I had a little fun with one of the guides by telling her I suddenly had this pain in my ass that felt like a pine cone and asked if she could get it out for me. R.B. had lots of information about the place and filled me in on several things. He told me he was a wealth of useless information, which I enjoyed. We continued around the house and then wandered over to the visitor center and gift shop. Along the way, I noticed a small stream that had been cascading down next to the house was no longer running. I got a book and we both had coffee. There were gates through the center of the house to the carriage track, a road six miles long that went all around the estate. And it closed at five o'clock. So we headed back to the car. I really wanted to see the rest of the area, though it was getting late. But we made it through the gates at 4.50 p.m. RB wasn't sure about it as he could see it was a bit narrow at the beginning of the track but I was enthusiastic about it, so we proceeded heading it up. It was absolutely one way, and you could really only travel at 15 miles per hour max. A short ways along, we found ourselves behind a small car and just followed them. It was extremely windy bendy along with being very narrow. RB was paying very close attention to his driving while I navigated with the tiny tourist map you get when you enter the estate. 
about a mile or so down the road, if you could call it that, we came to the most narrow part of the road where there was a rock face on the left that was straight up and down up against the tarmac and the wood guardrail on the right to prevent people from going down the steep embankment, which was only inches from the tarmac. I swear we were only going 15 miles per hour at the most, and I think less than that. He was paying attention while I navigated. Then bang, somehow we hit the rock face on the left. Suddenly the car went crazy shuddering and shaking while it loudly hit the rock face a couple more times, then sent the car off toward the guardrail on the right. The car was out of control at that point, shuddering and making nasty noises. I was asking, what's going on? Then the car hit the guardrail, taking out a main post along with a few yards of cross members held together by strips of metal and bolts. We found ourselves at an angle with the car partially on the tarmac and partially dangling over the edge, very much like the bus at the end of the Italian job. And it was pretty much straight down from there. The car was stopped, so I got out. I was perfectly okay, not even a scratch. RB doesn't remember opening the car door on his side. There was nothing to step out onto. He managed to crawl out the passenger side on his hands and knees. He got up and was quite shaken, wondering what had happened. Fortunately, the car ahead of us saw we were in distress and stopped. A nice lady in her 30s got out, and then her grandmother, who was visiting from Poland, got out. They came down to the, see what had happened. It was clear the car was not going anywhere and was thoroughly blocking the road with no way to get past unless you were on a cycle of some kind or walking. Shortly, another large black Land Rover came up behind us. I went over to the driver's window and let him know he was not getting past. <laughs> he said he could see that with a grin on his face and proceeded to back down the track which would have been most tricky. I'm sure his family were excited to make it through the gates just before they closed. Turned out that wasn't so lucky for them. The lady in the car ahead of us kindly offered to get us back to the visitor center. I climbed into the back next to her daughter in a car seat. I was in the middle and her grandmother climbed into the back next to me. R.B. took the front passenger seat, and the nice lady drove the rest of the way around the track while we had a nice conversation with them. I'm guessing it was around 6 p.m. by the time we got to the visitor center, which was closed. There were some caretaker cottages nearby where an older man was sitting in front of one enjoying a beer in his chair. The lady in the car let us out there. We gave her a hug and many thanks, and she went on her way. The man we found had an old Land Rover, and he found the groundskeeper, who was the head forester for the estate. He had a nice new large forestry pickup truck. His name was Chris, and soon his wife Joanne showed up, and we all joined in the conversation about what had happened and what we might do. Joanne got us water and tea while we worked to sort out the problem. All R.B. and I knew was that we couldn't leave the car there. It was decided that the next step was to go back up the cr to the crash site and assess it. I rode with Chris in his truck and R.B. rode with the guy in the Land Rover and we proceeded up the narrow track by way of locked gates. Chris had keys for everything. We reached the crash site, and the two caretakers discussed what could be done. The car was high-centered on a rock, leaving the front right tire dangling over the embankment. I'm surprised I was the only one who took pictures. Though both left side tires had been slashed, I thought that if we could use the one in the trunk, 
then hopefully any recovery truck might be able to repair or replace the other one. I also thought that the car's computer had likely gotten confused when it hit the rock and that it might reset so we could drive home. After all, we were over an hour and a half from home and had no idea how we would get back. The way the car was half hanging over the edge made it dangerous to just pull it back fully onto the road. There was the probability that as soon as it started to shift, that it would pivot toward the embankment and slide down it. And there was nowhere to anchor the front to prevent it shifting. The Land Rover guy would have tried pulling it back, but he was not insured for any problems that might follow. And it was not worth the risk. While the discussions continued, we discovered that Arby's phone had no reception. So we had no way to contact the AA, of which he was a platinum member. Fortunately, Chris had reception on his phone, so he found a number for the AA and called it. Over 50 minutes later, an endless phone cues and redirections. Press 1 if this is an emergency. Press 2 if you are dying, etc. He got through to a call center. Many questions later, <laughs> the call center forwarded him to his insurance company, who had to be called instead of the AA because it was an accident and not a breakdown. Several more minutes in phone options produced a result of a recorded message that Hastings Direct Insurance was closed for the day. Though their ads claim they are open 24-7, apparently that just applies if you want a quote for their crappy customer service. <laughs> there was no choice but to back down the track and return to the visitor center. So I cleaned out a few things from the car in case we didn't see it again. At least Chris had a way back down to a part where he could turn around and circumvent much of the carriage track. When we got back to the visitor center, the sun was going down. It was still very nice out. Chris and Joanne catered to us with more water and biscuits and taking us to the toilets, which had been locked. There were lots more minutes on the phone as Arby finally able to get a signal that often cut out. Somehow he got back in touch with the AA, who said they would send someone out. The sun went down while we waited outside in the parking lot next to Chris's truck. We both had nice conversations with Chris and Joanne as they lived in one of the cottages nearby. There was a bunkhouse next to the cottages, so they let us in one to keep us from freezing as it was rapidly getting cold and I was getting a chill. After two hours, there was still no sign of the AA, so Arby called them back. They said they would try to get someone out there by 10.30 p.m. In the meantime, Chris and Joanne babysat us in the bunkhouse. I talked to Joanne quite a bit about living there as it looked idyllic. She had lived in the area her entire life and loved it. Earlier, she pointed out the deer bouncing around in a meadow near the lake that supplied the power to the house. You really couldn't have asked for a nicer day for a disaster to happen. A little bit before 10.30 p.m., a man named Jason arrived with a flatbed recovery truck at the estate. After much more discussion, he went with Chris in the forestry truck up to the crash site, while R.B. and I remained at the bunkhouse with Joanne. Around an hour later, they came back. It was not good news. First of all, it was completely dark, and navigating the flatbed to the crash site would have been very tricky. Jason had not been fully informed of the situation and had thought it would just be changing tires. He had received the call at 9.30 p.m., which was the first anyone had been notified there was a call out for help. He said he needed to wait until the sun came up before trying to recover the car. Arby asked the others if anyone knew where we could lodge for the night. Everyone got back on their phones to try to find us a place. 
It was already after 11 p.m. on a Sunday night. After several calls, all to places that didn't answer their phones, it was apparent that there was no place to stay for the night. In the meantime, my cat at home was in the desperate throes of starvation. Poor thing. I could only hope that her extra four kilograms of fat would carry her through. The next possible option might have been to take us to where we would be able to catch a train or a bus home so that we might get my car and come back to sort it. It would have been an hour just to get to any station and then many more hours to get home as nothing would be operating until morning. Jason tried to get hold of the AA again, but they would not answer their phone. After much more discussion, Jason was in a quandary because he couldn't just leave us there. Between Jason and Chris, the decision was made to attempt to recover the car and take us home in his truck, car and all. It was already after midnight. We got a little excited at the prospect of being able to go home that night. But we were also aware of the danger regarding what they were going to try to do in the dark. So Jason and Chris headed back up to the crash site in their trucks while RB, me, and Joanne waited in the bunkhouse. Though everyone had remained calm, it was agony waiting to find out if they could safely remove the car or if it ended up down the embankment. And I'm sure it was very slow going just to get the recovery truck to the site due to its width. The logistics of it all was mind boggling. At least it wasn't raining. We were all getting tired. RB and I hadn't had a meal since the lunch at the George Hotel. I sat in a reasonably comfy chair and closed my eyes. I had the impression of being on holiday, waiting endlessly, sitting in a chair at an airport, and said as much, which got a laugh. Most of the time we were all chatting, but it slowed down in the longer time crept into the early hours of the morning. After two hours of not hearing anything, I had this huge urge to try to call them up at the crash site. But a loud voice in my head kept saying to leave them alone so they could do their jobs. Around 3.30 a.m., as I was coming back from another trip to the toilet, I saw both trucks were back, and the car was on the recovery truck flatbed. Hallelujah! <laughs> After initially finding the car was starting to slip off the edge when they hooked it up, they found a way to anchor the front of the car so it could be pulled back to the road. Once they got it on the flat bag, it took another 30 minutes just to get back down the road with Chris using a flashlight so Jason could see where the edges of the road were. Chris, Joanne, and Jason all went way above and beyond the call of duty. I tried to give Joanne and Chris 25 pounds so they could get a nice meal, but they wouldn't accept it. However, they said they would put it in the donation pot for the estate. We gave them hugs, climbed into the passenger cab of the recovery truck, and finally headed home at 3.45 a.m. There were more nice conversations on the way back. When we got to town, we picked up my car, fed the starving cat, and proceeded to take the damaged car to a mechanic's garage, who was kind of a friend and had been repairing RB's car for 10 years. The mechanic worked out of his house using a garage behind his house. Again, there were tricky negotiations to back the truck around the house on the narrow driveway to the garage. Jason unloaded the car onto the property. The car had been so badly damaged, the undercarriage was torn up and one wheel was turned 90 degrees. As Jason prepared to leave, we asked how to settle up the bill. He said AA would be footing the bill. We gave Jason a tip of 60 pounds and would have given him more, but that was the last of our cash. Jason said he was going to phone his boss to tell him he wasn't coming in that day. 
he still had an hour and a half drive back to Newcastle and it was already Monday. RB and I then went back to my place, finally arriving home at 5 a.m. as the sun was coming up. We got four hours of sleep before I took RB to an appointment in the town center at 11 a.m. He got me some cash to replace what I had given to the others and we went back to my place. At home we spent a lot more time on the phone as he contacted his insurance company. He and I talked about the consequences of going ahead with a claim that would require a police report, higher premiums on his insurance, and the loss of his no-claims discount. His car was only worth around 800 pounds. He wanted it repaired and was willing to pay for it out of his own pocket to keep in good standing with the insurance company and the DVLA though he would likely be insuring it with another company due to the bad service of his current insurer. As I have two cars, I easily put RB on my insurance and loaned him my small car. His lifestyle was such that he just could not survive without a car, and it was my fault he went up the carriage track, so I felt that was fair. He was then able to do the things he already had plans to do and went home. I spent the rest of the day zoned out on the couch with my eyes closed as I was decompressing. What is important about all this is what we take away from it. Yes, it was a disaster. As disasters go, it went rather smoothly considering this was all happening on a Sunday night way out in the country with little or no phone reception. The weather was decent. We had people helping us right and left, all wondering how to help these dazed and confused seniors. It could have been so much worse. We could have gone over the embankment and been seriously injured. Instead, neither of us got even a scratch and didn't even get an adrenaline rush out of it. No one freaked out. Everyone was calm while we all carefully considered how to proceed. RB was worried about all of the potential expenses, but it really was minimal. We just hoped the estate wouldn't send us a big bill to repair the guardrail. However, I expect that the event might be more of a catalyst to widen the track at least where we crashed. We met a lot of very nice people that day, and we very much appreciated it and told them so. It was a lesson in patience while experiencing the eternity of waiting. Considering that it all could have gone much more wrong, like ending up down the embankment or so much worse with injuries, for me it was about having faith that it would get sorted reasonably well, and it did. I thank my guardian angels for that. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe.